Hello, Matt. Experiments in Gurometry short form decoding continue. It's like the fly, you know. <laughs> Experiment number two 45 minutes, not that short form. Not that short form. Let's see how we get on this time. <laughs> We're going to get it down to 10 eventually. We're going to get there, guys. You get there. This is what, you know, it's science. You 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 reiterate and you make improvements and, you know, you, you refine things. So, mm. so that's what we're doing today. And we're looking at a very specific piece of content. It's not audio. It is a tweet or a zit or whatever the fuck they're called now. Mm -hmm. Two of them. Two of them in particular. And... This is in the wake of the announcement of the Nobel Prize for Carrico and Wiseman for mRNA vaccines, right? Developments mm. therein. And well-deserved because we just had a pandemic and they saved millions of lives because of the ability to quickly formulate effective vaccines. But this did not go down well in Guruland. <laughs> And in particular, Robert Malone, the famed Kenny Rogers style self-declared inventor of mRNA, was not happy. Matt. Not happy. Not happy. So this is the guy that claimed on the, um, the Dark Horse podcast and in many other places that he is the inventor of mRNA vaccines. He's got some patent on it. This is not a claim that seems to have any endorsement. Uh, amongst the broader scientific community. And it turns out not in Copenhagen either, where they <laughs> no. had to... <laughs> And uh, Dan Wilson from Debunk the Funk actually produced this little graphic where it has all of the various steps involved in producing the mRNA vaccines, right? And one that shows you, you know, how, how much of a collaborative effort it is. But two, it shows you that like Robert Malone was involved in one stage along time ago mm. and actually didn't stick with it. Like these people are being rewarded because they are the faces of the vaccination effort, the technology. They championed it even when it wasn't um, yep. receiving attention. That's yep. that's why they're being that's right. rewarded. And they made a key breakthrough, right, that enabled it to happen. And look, there's obviously always a sense in which the prize that gets handed out is a little bit arbitrary because we all stand on the shoulders of giants and all that. But um, well-deserved, I would say. And um, if anyone's seen the response and the videos and the interviews and so on with um, Catalan Carrico, it's kind of cool. Like when she heard about that she'd, she'd receive the Nobel Prize, she happened to be teaching a lecture and she continued teaching. <laughs> pretty much pretty much unfazed and in the interview of the Nobel Prize community people when they called her about it which I listened to I really liked her response which was she immediately segued to emphasizing the foundational research that was done in the 50s and 60s that sort of led up to this she switched the topic to how she really appreciated her husband being very supportive of her and she's very proud of her daughter who happens to have gold medals in in rowing at the olympics and stuff like that and talked about her her collaborator uh, drew weissman and she presents very much as the the anti-guru <laughs> like an actual nerdy geeky not particularly sociable <laughs> scientist the kind of person that actually does do um, exceptional things if they're lucky and if they uh, keep focusing on what they're doing. So you and I, Chris, mm. and this was the funny thing, you and I, um, in, when we noted this, we we obviously remembered about the uh, claims on the Dark Horse podcast about him being the inventor of the, Malone that is, being the inventor of the mRNA vaccine. And we knew this wouldn't go down well with Brett Weinstein, but we thought that they would leave it alone. We, we thought that them making a big deal out of this would not be a good look and they would see that. But we were wrong, weren't we? Well, yeah, I saw, I think it was Stuart Neal was predicting that Robert Malone is going to you know, respond very negatively to this news. And I was thinking, no, it would be too on the nose. It would be too revealing of their insecurities and, and self-aggrandizing tendencies to, to do that. And I was wrong. I <laughs> overestimated both <laughs> Robert Malone and Brett that they wouldn't be so petty to be very upset at this news. Yeah, I genuinely did give them too much credit. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah. So let's let's hear the tweets. What did what did Robert Malone have to say about this first? He said, Carrickel and Weissman get the Nobel, not for inventing mRNA vaccines, brackets, because I did that, <laughs> but for adding the pseudouridine that allowed unlimited spike toxins to be manufactured in what could have been a safe and effective vaccine platform, if safely developed. Good to know. And I just like that he had to put in brackets because I did that, right? <laughs> just, to, just to be clear that people understood. Like, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, they, Robert Malone is somehow managing to be the person that takes credit for the invention of the mRNA vaccines, but also being a um, Cassandra about the dangers of mRNA vaccines. So he squared that circle quite nicely. Yeah. And, and, and very gracious, I think, in, uh, <laughs> in acknowledging that. Well, that's something as well that he has to do, right? Because it's, it's an interesting tightrope that he needs to walk, a bit like Trump, that he wants to be recognized as this, influential person involved in the development of this new technology which got all this acclaim but he's also an anti-vaxxer appealing to an audience that thinks it's a, a <laughs> an injection of you know toxic chemicals that destroys your health so he obviously doesn't want to claim credit for that so he has to be you know clear that it's it's more the potential that the technology could have been good if they had followed his, his original yeah yeah and look i think i've i think i've beat this drum before but we really have to emphasize to people who haven't worked in scientific disciplines before but there are good ideas there are good streams of research that have been going on for potentially decades which hundreds or thousands of people may have had a hand in it's quite common like malone's situation there will be heaps of people like him that had dabbled or had even made some sort of significant contribution to this broader stream of research and who if they are not narcissists would not be claiming full credit for the breakthrough and i've cited this before and i emphasize that i was and also ran somebody who dabbled in something, and that is the convolutional neural networks developed by Jan LeCun. Nobody else was working on them. We were doing a little bit of work on them in Japan. We played around for a year or two. We published some cool results, and then we moved on and forgot about it. In the final analysis, our contribution was zero to negligible. It was nothing because mm. we didn't stick with it. right? We, <laughs> we, just, we did a little bit of thing, and we moved on. And because we're not freaks, we don't think that any of the credit, none of it, of the amazing developments on artificial intelligence should be attributed to us. I mean, I just cite that personal example as an illustration that like virtually any academic could point to something and say that they had a contribution. I mean, I suspect Malone's contribution to mRNA vaccines was actually more substantial than our uh, for one on CNNs, but I don't, I, I don't know the details of that stuff. I don't think it was that much more substantial but the, yeah in in general it wouldn't even matter right like he, he could have been responsible for a very key component in history but there's lots of key component uh, like precursor technologies and even then i believe a bunch of people have done deep dives into it and i revealed that he wasn't not much, right not but, much to it yeah yeah so brett somebody partly responsible for promoting malone into you know the heterodox attention ecosystem uh, because he initially appeared on the dark horse podcast he also responded to the news and he first responded to the, the announcement with a post saying welcome to the new dark age under the picture of them receiving you know the the award or so the announcement that they will receive the award so that was nice and then he followed that up by more specifically saying, this Nobel Prize is incredible. Not given for the core mRNA, and he puts quotation marks, vaccine technology, work done by Robert Malone, whose devastating critiques they clearly wish to obscure. He actually just wrote the clearly wish to obscure. Yep. It was given instead for the biggest brackets of many design defects in the shots pseudo uridine mm. yeah, yeah so there's tons there and just all that that devastating critique 
Malone's <laughs> devastating critique, like editorializing very much there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so he's he's still tripling down on Robert Malone being the true inventor of mRNA vaccines. So he was robbed. So two things, Chris. First thing is we have to add Robert Malone <laughs> to the list of people in Brett Weinstein's oh, yeah. immediate family and friend circle who have been unfairly denied Nobel Prizes. I forget that's what the right. count is up. Jesus, <laughs> it's up to four now. And, and that's only the ones they've talked publicly about. I'm sure there's more, but yeah, yep. it's... It doesn't seem that hard to get Nobel Prizes in Brett's imagination. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've had the worst luck. You know, yeah. they, 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 they keep losing Nobel Prizes. But the other little beautiful thing about that, which I didn't catch until the second reading, was that in Brett's framing, what's happened here is that the Nobel Prize Committee there in Copenhagen has handed out this Nobel Prize to a pair of nobodies, a couple of people who did nothing, really, mm. because... They must have gotten a call from Fauci or something. They, they got the message that we need to obscure oh, this guy, Robert right. Malone, who's made so many devastating critiques and we have to kind of divert attention. I feel like there was a conference that none of us were invited to. Sorry, Eric just popped in there. <laughs> so, uh, I, I thought I heard him ringing in my head. But, uh, I, oh, yeah. I there, back there was a conference, there were phone calls, there were meetings, and Eric and Brett weren't invited to them. And what's happened is that, you know, the word has come down that they need to obscure Robert Malone's contribution to the mRNA vaccines because his critiques of them have been so devastating. And that is how the Nobel Prize Committee makes their decisions about who to give them to. Yeah, so anyway, the long hand of Fauci Chris, his tentacles reach everywhere, all the way to Copenhagen. Brett has figured it out. And, you know, we talked about this before as well, but the kind of ironic thing here is that this is a perfect story for the heterodox sphere to gobble up because you actually have a story of a researcher who the mainstream kind of spurned, like not entirely, but basically mm. had the struggle a bit was not awarded you know big grants and wasn't given the limelight but stuck with a technology that many didn't see the promise with and eventually was vindicated right so it is an underdog story with a kind of retiring figure not seeking out the limelight and you could spin it as a an example of how the mainstream institution of science like failed to appropriately you know yeah, reward acknowledge. somebody who yeah, who is diligent and working hard. But they that's can't right. because their egos don't allow that to be the no, story. That's right. Catalan Carrico doesn't happen to be in the circle of reactionary heterodox grifters. So that courtesy isn't extended to her. So for people who may not know, you know, she it's fair to say she sort of struggled in her academic career couldn't get grants, was actually demoted and lost her position at Penn University but before joining this um, biomedical company and doing this work which, which, which culminated in that breakthrough. So it is a lot of egg on the face of an institution like the Penn State University um, where, you know, you just sort of let go <laughs> a Nobel Prize winner <laughs> like just a couple of years before that breakthrough. So it is a good story. What was nice is that so opposite to the gurus, she, she didn't dwell on that Wallow stuff. in the grievance. Wallow in no. the grievance. No, whereas she actually kind of had a grievance there. And, you know, we talked about this, Chris, that, you know, you have to be a little bit careful and there's like a post hoc kind of fallacy. There is a fair amount of luck involved. There's a lot of researchers who could be working diligently, solving, you know, really hard problems. And it can often be hard to tell, except in retrospect, which was the one that happened to be working on the thing that turned out to be the thing that we really needed at the time. But even having said that, I think there's a legitimate story there about the way academia kind of, you know, uses metrics and so on in order to figure out who is who is worthy of things like tenure and promotion and so on. Both things are definitely true that like I saw people arguing that she should have been showered with millions of pounds of, of grants, like obviously. And like you say, there's a little bit of the sharpshooters fallacy yeah, yeah. at play there. And it, it doesn't have to be that because even it could be the case that some researcher is very diligent and, you know, very productive and so on, but actually isn't a good project manager or that kind of thing, or is overly attached to something. So, but I'm, I'm not saying that's the case with her. 
but more that it's the wrong heuristic to apply. And this is why I think in some cases that people find it hard to accept the Nobel disease, right? Where Nobel Prize winners go on to advocate for pseudosciences or that kind of thing, because they assume there's like a, a level of brilliance that would j- just make you immune to that. But that's, it's again, it's like, it's just a kind of misattribution. But I definitely also think that academia is not perfectly calibrated in how it allocates funding or how it evaluates proposals. So, you know, mm. both things both things are true. And it, it could equally be that she did deserve a lot more resources. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. It's an impossible problem. Like, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, we should have allocated heaps more public research funding and foundational research on artificial neural networks back in the 1990s. Mm. But, you know, that's easy to say now, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, a nice little story there. Brett Weinstein continuing to undershoot our expectations despite them being in the floor. Yeah. And Tucker Carlson hosting Robert Malone to God knows talk about whatever he said on there. But it's just, yeah, the people continue and their insecurities and sense of grievance, their belief that they are deserving of the highest accolades in science. And, you know, Brett Weinstein was also talking recently, thanking someone for suggesting that he deserved I can't remember, was it a Pulitzer for his work on ivermectin? Or it was some, you know, high profile investigatory mm. award. And instead of downplaying it, Brett, of course, retweets it and says, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just astonishing people. So yeah. that's it. That's right. The institutions have totally failed us. Brett's completely right. But yeah, Robert Malone, if you want to know who that guy is, he's someone, like you said, he goes on Tucker Carlson in there with Matt Getz and Tim Pool. He's just part of that set of, of weird grifter, right-wing reactionary conspiratorial types and one cute little thing chris this is the final thing i'll leave you on is that in his uh criticisms of the 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 rhetoric around vaccination he keeps calling the pro-vaccine messaging as neuro-linguistic programming and i i kind of appreciated that because neuro-linguistic programming is a load of sense horseshit yeah that's right he doesn't know he doesn't even know what those words mean i just noticed by the way matt the things he's tweeting about with tucker from his old appearance there but it, it doesn't matter he, he would be on there like a short a shot he's retweeting kevin sorbo <laughs> ex hercules actor turned brain pilled red pilled maniac so disappointed the point i want to leave people with is you cannot underestimate <laughs> these people you you simply cannot just assuming they won't take the most the most base reaction the most insecure the most petty reaction mm. is yeah. is wrong your model is wrong they will every time yeah. they'll surpass your low expectations so yeah exactly exactly and you know what chris you might have missed it but his first tweet about that was murderous work on mRNA technology wins the Nobel Prize. Robert Malone responds. Uh, from Vigilant News. I don't know Vigilant News, but it sounds it sounds like what sounds it is, great. I think. Sounds really yeah, it sounds, sounds great. Sounds great. And so Robert Malone, by the way, is is a good example of the like the kind of like how you have to be a little bit nuanced in terms of how you trust credible experts. Right? It's not enough to sort of look around the entire infosphere and find one person who's got some academic track record on Google Scholar. And you can point to that person and say, okay, there we go. You know, I've got my expert here. It's fine. The point is, is that he is an outlier. He is a very distinct outlier in the field of opinion. And furthermore, there is a huge amount of evidence that he is, in terms of his political outlook, his worldview, his personality, a very strange person indeed. And so bombshell to everyone, strange people exist in science and academia as well. And you you cannot apply such a simple heuristic. You actually have to look at the consensus, at, at the weight of expert opinion, not pick out individual people that have some kind of track record who happen to 
be on the side of the issue that you prefer. Good point to finish on, Matt, and I'll stop it there. 20 minutes. We've done well. We've done good. Good job, Chris. Well done, Matt. All right. Good job, Matt. Good job, Matt. All right. So bye-bye. Ciao.